Well, what a delight it is to be here, but I do have to disagree with Matt Briggs. You see, Matt, who is my uh, distinguished co-author, a wonderful statistician, statistician indeed to the stars, uh, Matt ha has told you today that there are no aliens among <laughs> us. Now, I have to make a confession here. I believe in aliens being among us. They band themselves into organizations with strange acronymic titles. N-A-S-A, N-O-A-A, N-C-D-C, G-I-S-S, U-A, what's it, U-E-A, E-P-A. They are among us. <laughs> so I thought I would put my belief in aliens on record. <laughs> now, the subject of all our talks today is really this extraordinarily vicious campaign that has been conducted by a small, poisonous, narrow group of ideologues against those of us who blamelessly ask questions about whether the party line on climate change may perhaps not be quite as it should be. So let me begin by giving one or two instances of what they get up to. Cooking the books is this one. Now, here is Senator Whitehouse, a falsehood incarnate, who says that we are at odds with the vast majority of peer-reviewed climate science. So, uh, Dave Lee Gates, Matt Briggs, Willie Soon, and I checked. And in 2013, we went through Cook et al. 2013, which had claimed a 97.1% consensus. Dave Leegate was the lead author of our paper here and placed it very successfully in the Learned Journal of Science and Education, where it was duly published after peer review. And what we found was that of 11,944 abstracts reviewed by Cook et al., they had themselves in their own data file listing all the 11,944 papers, marked only 64 of them as stating the consensus definition that they used in their paper, which is the scientific consensus that human activity is very likely causing most of the current global warming, anthropogenic global warming, or AGW. They took that as their definition. They marked only 64 papers in category one, which was that definition. And they reported the result by this ingenious sequence of fiddles as 97%. When we read the 64 papers, we found only 41 of them did actually say what they had said they had said, which is 0.3%. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the true size of the consensus on climate change. We are the majority now. <laughs> and here it is. Uh, you can see their propaganda thing. 97% agree that we are the cause of global warming. No, 99.7% didn't say that. Now, of course, you know what's coming. I'm going to tell you a tale of two scientists. And here we are back with the accident-prone Senator Whitehouse, the merchant of smear, who had a go at Willie Soon for having received the staggering sum of $1.2 million. Let's put that into context, shall we? <laughs> this was actually spread over something like 10 years, and he only got about a third of it, which works out, uh, with my brilliant mathematics, about $40,000 a year. I had a word with McDonald's before I came here. I said, can I have a job as a burger flipper? I said, I get paid more for doing that than I would for talking about climate change. How much would they pay me? And they said $45,000 a year. So Willie Soon would actually have been better off as a burger flipper than he would doing some of the best and most distinguished solar physics on the planet. So let's put that into context and give him a round of applause. Well, now here you see uh, on the right, Willie Soon, and on the left, a character called Joel Schwartz, who is at the University of, as I believe they call it, Harvard. <laughs> now, Willie Soon, remember, $1.2 million, $1 million. Schwartz got 
over the last few years, $31 million from the EPA. <laughs> you see, these aliens are getting in everywhere. Now, <laughs> what he did recently was to write with colleagues at Harvard and Syracuse universities a paper praising to the skies the EPA's proposed regulations to shut down the coal industry on the grounds that the coal industry is one of the biggest uh, uh, donors to the Republican Party. <laughs> now, <laughs> 31 million he had had over the years from the EPA. He writes a paper saying the EPA is wonderful. He doesn't disclose, disclose any conflict of interest at all. And then Harvard University puts out a press release describing his paper as an independent paper. <laughs> now, this is extraordinary. Soon had no conflict of interest. We wrote uh, our paper in the Chinese Science Bulletin, which set all this going, simply because we were interested in finding out what the truth was. We were seekers after truth, as Abu Ali al-Haytham used to call it. And you can go to scibull.com, rather an unfortunate uh, <laughs> address, and click, click on, um, I'm slightly embarrassed by that, click on uh, most read articles, and we are the all-time number one. And please do that, because the more hits we get, the more they realize that it is we who are now in the majority on this climate science question. Your duty is to get all your friends to click cybull.com, most read articles, and then download the paper. Now, Harvard Smithsonian, on uh, accusations being made that Willie Soon hadn't declared his conflict of interest because he'd had his burger flippers money from a fossil fuel company, issued a press release, that's his employers, falsely accusing him of failure to disclose this conflict of interest. They also falsely implied he doesn't think we're a cause of climate change. Our paper had made it quite clear that he and all of us realise that we can, in theory, have some influence on climate change. If you breathe out, you're breathing out CO2. That's changing the climate. So, worse, Harvard Smithsonian's director falsely stated that Willie had been wrong to declare his affiliation in his published climate papers as Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Now, a previous director of the Harvard Smithsonian had given instructions that that was how everybody was to disclose their affiliation, and that instruction had not been rescinded, and Willie, for 25 years, had blamelessly been using that as his affiliation. And to make matters worse, the director then tried to pretend that the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics didn't exist, even though he was the director of it. <laughs> now, uh, Willie's co-authors were quite offended by the suggestion that there had been a failure on our part, and I as lead author, to disclose a material conflict of interest that we should have disclosed. The proper course of action would have been to investigate. So we did investigate most thoroughly. And we produced a 10-page report, which we sent to every one of the 40-odd regents of the Smithsonian, the trustees of this organization. And some 500 eminent scientists, including Freeman Dyson, Eugene Parker, the discoverer of the solar wind, who isn't even a climate skeptic, eminent scientists from all over the world with whom Willie has worked or who had heard of him and just felt he was being badly treated, were willing to put their names to our report calling upon the Smithsonian to investigate the disgraceful conduct of the director of the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics that doesn't exist. <laughs> and so their replies were, were just what our finding was, first of all, the Smithsonian was solely at fault because it had signed a contract, it had negotiated a contract, well, it had nothing to do with it, with a fossil fuel company as the funder. And the Smithsonian had agreed to a term in that contract put forward by the funder, please don't use our name in public. Now, Willie, as an employee of the Smithsonian, was required by contract law and by his duty of care to his employers in negligence law to make sure that he complied with that contract term, whatever he may have thought of it. And he did comply. The fault for any non-disclosure that ought to have been made lies squarely with the Smithsonian and not with Willie Soon. I wanted to make that clear to all of you, just how outrageous the mistreatment of him has been. <laughs> now, 
Now I'm going to show you what a real conflict of interest actually looks like. <laughs> this is Schwartz. Harvard issued that press release describing this anti-coal uh, regulations paper as being independent. Though uh, this Schwartz, the Harvard co-author, had previously taken 31 million in funding from the EPA, the very organization about which he was writing in this paper. Schwartz's lead author, one Driscoll, from what I am told is a university at Syracuse, said, wrote to the EPA, a woman called Ellen at the EPA, saying, oh, I hope all is well. We're having a lovely time putting together. Thank you so much for all the help with uh, this paper, which says how wonderful the EPA is. Oh, and by the way, while I'm on the subject, I wonder if we could have some money. <laughs> and that is an independent paper. Pull the other one, Squire, it's got bells on. So I wrote to Drew Faust, the dreadful president of Harvard, and I said, you must withdraw that mendacious press release. Mendacious means lying. <laughs> you can't say a paper is independent when the lead author is writing to the organization. He's writing about it, saying, please, can we have some money? And when two of the authors between them had had not 31, but $45 million in funding from the EPA over the, over the previous seven years. We asked her to write to Nature Climate Change, where the study appeared, so as to disclose Schwartz's 31 million conflict of interest and get it put on the record. We asked her to investigate why Schwartz hadn't done that. I asked her to answer these questions. Why did you call the paper independent? Why did Schwartz not disclose his interest? Why did Harvard bodies attack Dr. Soon's one million where he had no discernible conflict of interest because he was writing about simply solar activity, nothing to do with the fossil fuel company that was funding him. While they indulged Schwartz's 31 million, where there was a direct conflict of interest because the money had come from the organization, that was the very subject of the paper he was writing. To whom I said, should I complain to get this matter investigated? And here is this priceless reply. We appreciate your taking the time to share your perspective on this important set of issues. <laughs> I had just reported corruption, fraud, mendacity, and a complete collapse of how any academic institution, let alone Harvard, ought to behave. And I get that as the only reply to date. So I wrote to her again. I said, I'm coming here to Washington. I'm going to be talking to congressmen and senators. I'm going to be asking for a congressional investigation of your misconduct in not dealing with this matter properly when it was drawn to your attention. And I am confident of getting one. And I can report to those of you who weren't here yesterday that Sen uh, Congressman Smith, uh, very kind of the chairman of the Space and Science Committee, has agreed to look at the paperwork and to see whether he can carry out an investigation. I have had an acknowledgement of my letter to him from his chief of uh, operations uh, today already, saying they've now got the paperwork and they are looking at it. So, Drew Faust, we're watching. Now, I want to run through very quickly some of the other things they mess around with. Here is Steve Goddard's wonderful ways that they tamper with the temperature. You'll see it again at GISS. Separate thing, same thing. You push down the earlier years of the century, increase the later ones, steeper and steeper the slope. Here it is in New Zealand, here it is in Australia. They're doing this all over the world. This is the NCDC, this is Tom Carl's lot. Half, very nearly, of the warming of the 20th century comes from adjustments to the previous temperature data. And here's another thing that the IPCC does. You stretch the vertical axis of your graph, it looks terrifying on top. Let's not stretch it at the bottom, and suddenly it looks far less bad. Here's what was published in a paper in 2006 about the rapid growth of hurricanes, which we now know haven't grown. How do we know? If you go back a bit further in the record, you see that that was what was the case. Um, here's a fictional sea level rise. Sea level's actually been falling since 2003, 2003 to 2008. It fell, according to the GRACE gravitational recovery satellites. So they added a glacial isostatic adjustment. <laughs> and suddenly, we have sea level rise at three millimeters a year when actually it's zero. And Carl, oh yes, Tom Carl of NOAA, trying to eliminate the pause. Now, uh, the IPCC said that by now we should be getting at least 1.9 Celsius of uh, warming per century. 
rate equivalent. Its best estimate was actually 2.8. The outturn is zero, according to both the ocean data sets and the two satellite data sets. It isn't happening. And you, the terrestrial ones do show a little bit of warming, but that's after those enormous adjustments, so they probably don't amount to very much. But Carl himself <laughs> suddenly says that even though the oceans below the surface are not warming at all, and haven't for 15 years, and the atmosphere above, the lower troposphere above, isn't warming, somehow the interface between the two is warming. Sir, that is an attempted repeal of the laws of thermodynamics... <laughs> And they, whether you like it or not, are beyond the reach of any human legislature. <laughs> and science frauds, my goodness, look at this one, where five times the IPCC in 1995 said, we can't find a human influence. What was printed, the consensus of just one man whom the bureaucrats got to rewrite it, was that there's now a discernible human influence on global climate. There wasn't then, there isn't now, they made it up. Here is one of my favourite fiddles, where you see they've tried to say, taking the temperature record of the last 150 years, that the slope is ever increasing, and therefore this is an acceleration in global warming, and we are to blame. You can see that, in fact, there were two previous periods with exactly the same rate of warming, which they had concealed by putting the trend lines over the top of them. That's the truth. Indeed, if you take a sine wave, which has by definition a zero trend, and apply perfectly correctly calculated trend lines to it, the IPCC can make even a sine wave appear to be on an accelerating <laughs> trend. They've even used the same colours I have. Then we have the hokey stick, which I'm just going to flick through, and you can see these slides. I'm not even going to talk about them. You all know this. But this is an interesting one, because there's the hokey stick graph at the bottom. There is the sea level change reconstructed over the past thousand years from a completely separate source, Grinstead et al., 2009. You can see it kind of goes up in the medieval warm period by eight inches, down again by eight inches in the uh, Little Ice Age, and then up to the middle uh, where we are today. But the hockey stick graph doesn't do that. But what does do that is Hubert Lamb's graph from the 1990 IPCC report showing that there was a medieval warm period. There, I put it to you, is the simplest demonstration that the hockey stick graph is hokey. So what are we going to do about pseudoscience? We are going to make sure that you get on and write letters to the scientific journals, write short contributions, write papers, make sure they hear that there is another side of the case. We are going to do congressional investigations. We've got the contact now. We're going to use it. Judicial climate science inquiry, which Bob Carter mentioned, is devastatingly effective. Anything in the forum of a court where each side can cross-examine the other, we can sustain that. They cannot. Report science fraud to the police. If you see them fitting there, <laughs> tell the police. We've been doing this quietly all over the world. Make sure that if it is an international fraud with several countries involved, you ask the police to send it to Interpol. Interpol have already opened a file on this. Eventually, they're going to snap and say, we can't let this go on. We will prosecute. That's the way to stop this corruption. Private prosecution in England, we're also looking at. And I'm going to finish off, just for a bit of fun, it take one second, this is the coat of arms of Harvard. The words that they can only understand one letter per page at Harvard, they're still there. <laughs> but veritas is the word for truth. But we've seen how Harvard and Drew Faust behave. That is what it should look like. <laughs> and I understand from my friend among the cheerleaders at Harvard that they have a new cheerleader song. And it goes like this. Lie, la, lie. Lie, lie, lie. Lie, 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 lie. Thank you.